Well, good morning. Uh, today's scripture reading is from Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Um, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, there's a very well-known three-part parable. It's the parable of the lost sheep, lost coin, and the lost son. Now, I was studying this passage recently. I, it's one of the, 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 the parts of the uh, Gospels that I love to just keep going and revisiting over and over again because it's one of those things in the Scriptures for me. You know, everybody seems to have something, but this is one of them for me that just keeps speaking to me in different ways every time I read it. And so um, I, I went back to it. I've been reading it and reading it. And as I was studying this passage recently, I came across a false teaching regarding it. What do you do when you find a false teaching? Um, whenever I read something that's a little questionable in my mind, I hear the music, dun, 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 right? And so I start doing my research. Well, there's a commentary that's used by many, many evangelical Christians, conservative Christians, that, that, that believes that a, a good shepherd, what do they do with a wayward sheep? They find their lost sheep, and when they find their lost sheep, they take a rod that they have in their belt, and they break the legs of the wayward sheep to teach the sheep a lesson to not go astray again, and then carries the sheep on his shoulders, and during the time that the leg is healing, the shepherd and the sheep start to bond. And because of that relationship, the sheep will never run away ever again. I don't know about you, but I'm not so sure about that. Um, animals are quite smart uh, with these kinds of uh, violent types of things. Um, well, apparently many Christians believe this because many pastors preach this, but it's a complete myth. Furthermore, not only is it a myth based on doing cultural and historical research about shepherds in the Middle East, um, but Jesus himself, as he tells the parable of the lost sheep, does not even for a moment reference any form of rebuke or scolding that the shepherd does to the sheep. The entire purpose of it is that the sh shepherd leaves the 99 behind and finds this one sheep and brings that one sheep home, cradling it, holding it, and throws a big celebration for finding his sheep. But what does a myth as such produce? A myth that a good shepherd will harm his sheep to rescue the sheep. It produces a mindset among Christians that God purposely brings pain into my life so that I can be healed. God purposely does harmful and difficult and suffering things into my life so that I could be rescued. And a rational mind hears that and says, this is all too crazy. It's crazy. It's quite crazy. And a careful reading of scripture agrees with that rational mind. Today, I want to share with you a message about this idea of repentance. You know, we're on the topic of prayer. And there's a kind of prayer called the prayer of repentance. It's one major type of prayer that we do. But we need to understand gospel repentance. There's a, a, a group of believers in this world that believe that before repentance comes the absolute fear of God. Yet, the New Testament teaches us that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And so, we look at the text before us today, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, where Peter is telling all those who are listening to him preach for the very first time. And he's, 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 he lays out this sermon, and the people respond, and they say, what shall we do? And the text lays before us an invitation an invitation to do three things. The first thing is to repent. Second thing is to be baptized. And thirdly is to receive the Holy Spirit. Repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit. And you have to imagine this narrative that's going on in here. This isn't just a, a verse. We just read one verse, but it's not an isolated situation. 
It's connected to not only the day of Pentecost, but it's connected to the entire historical narrative of the Jewish people. You, we have to think about what's going on in this moment when Peter extends this invitation for the people to repent, to be baptized, and to receive the Holy Spirit. From creation to salvation, all the way through, from the point where God created the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1. And we place the man and woman in the midst of a garden that was full and full and abundant with all of his provisions. And he loved Adam and he loved Eve and he gave them everything. But Adam and Eve chose a different way to see the world and to live in the world. They chose a path that would basically say, I'm going to look at myself. I'm going to keep my eyes on myself. I'm going to keep focused on myself, what I can do, what I need to do, what I must do. I'm going to also look at my surroundings and try to navigate my life based on my surroundings. And I'm going to look at my spouse for all my worth and value. I'm going to look at my work for my worth and value. I'm going to look at what I do to determine my value and my worth. And so as theologians say, they fell. They fell. Their relationship with God became disrupted. And that was transmitted from generation to generation. A broken way of living was given to generation to generation to generation. And since then, people tried in every way possible to get back to this place called Eden. To get back to the so-called paradise. Every religion, every worldview, every philosophy has attempted to take humanity back to some form of what was before, some kind of an ideal that was before. Every science, knowledge, discipline, and understanding tries to do some version of making things better, making things great, making things good. And in the biblical narrative, from Noah to Abraham, from Abraham to Moses, from Moses to Samuel, from Saul to David, through all the kings of Israel and Judah, the people of God did everything to live in the provision and blessing of God once again. From restarting humanity through Noah, establishing a new tribes of people, a people group uh, through Abraham, and forming a nation and giving of laws through, through Moses, and establishing a kingship through Samuel, these things were supposed to help them look to God, but instead cause them to keep looking further and further into themselves. And you hear throughout the biblical narrative where God is continuing to invite people and calling people to come back, to look to him and not to themselves. But all of this looking to myself eventually leads Israel to become slaves to an empire again. And a great many people are dispersed throughout the surrounding regions and nations. But they begin hearing words of promise through the prophets. Promise of redemption, restoration, and forgiveness. And then one day there's a man who comes in the midst of the established Jewish culture and religion and begins to preach a different message. A message that is filled with the authority of God. A message that is telling people that someone's going to come really soon. And that person's going to be the awaited Messiah. The people's ears perk up. They're, they're listening. They're listening, they're watching, and they're waiting. Is it true? Finally, this person's actually going to come? We're going to be saved? And you have to imagine that this is the narrative. This is what the Jewish faith understood. That, that, that one day, God would send somebody who's going to save them. They didn't understand what kind of salvation, but they were waiting for some kind of salvation or restoration of some sort. What will make the people look up to God once again? What will make the people look to God and place all their hopes and dreams in him again? What we have to understand about the Jewish faith and the way the Jewish people were living out their faith in the time of Jesus is that it's quite possible to have God in your life, but if you have the wrong framework, you're stuck. You're stuck trying to, for you to reach out to God based on your ability to do something. Because that's the story for thousands and thousands of years, from generation to generation, for the people of Israel. And then Jesus comes upon the scene, and he begins his ministry, and he begins to say, repent. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Repent. A while ago, I did a series on repentance, and I shared that repent means metanoia. Repentance means metanoia, to change your mind, to change your mind. There's further context. There's actually, it's changing your mind after spending time with someone. It's not just an idea of self-changing of your mind, but you become affected because you've spent time with someone. And so when Jesus is calling us to repentance, it's spend time with me and you will be changed. 
Spend time with me. And when you spend time with me, your, your, your thoughts about God is going to change. Your thoughts about yourself are going to change. And you're going to change your mind about worship. You're going to change your mind about life. You're going to change your mind about so many things. Repent. Repent not because you've been bad. Repent because the orientation of your life might just be in the wrong direction. Repent because God is calling you to look to him and to, to, to gaze upon him and to fix your life upon him and not to yourself. Why? Because what Jesus does is going to change everything the way we understand about God and how we relate to God. And so here we are in today's text. Jesus took the cross. Jesus rose from the grave. Forty days later, he went up to heaven. Ten days later, he, the followers of Jesus, 120 of them, are gathered in, in Jerusalem for this Pentecost feast. And it's the day that Jewish people from all over the known world at that time are coming to make their pilgrimage to Jerusalem, to the temple, to celebrate the giving of the law of Moses. But this day was going to be different. The people gathering in Jerusalem began to hear some sounds coming from a house. And the people were speaking and praising in many different languages. It was a different spirit, a different experience. you got to imagine that these folks have been coming year after year, every single year, to the same place. It's not going to a different vacation site every year. It's coming to the same location, the same city, the same route that you come in through to the city, on your way to the temple. It's the same thing every single year. And for those who had experienced this year after year after year, they noticed that something was different that day. And they began to gather around this place. Some of them began to wonder, are they drunk? Are these people drunk? Peter hears this. He stands up and he says, "Uh, no, we're not drunk. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. We're not drunk. And he uses that as an opportunity to, to bring in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He speaks to this narrative of the people of Israel. And at the end, he makes this invitation that we hear this morning. An invitation to repent. To stop. Stop relating to God the way we've been doing it all along. To change our minds here. To believe. To believe that there's something called salvation given to us in Jesus Christ. And that invitation to be baptized is to join him. It's not simply the ritual that you and I might have been in where you might have been poured with water, sprinkled with water, or you might have been dunked all the way in, regardless of the way that you've done it. But the the invitation to baptism is much more. It's it's, it's to join Jesus, to to be enmeshed with him, to to be with him by believing in him. And in doing so, to receive the Holy Spirit. There's these three things that, you know, I hear people, myself, constantly wondering. I want to live in the victory of God, in the the miraculous power of God. And to have the hand of God clearly working in my life, not once in a while, but on an ongoing, regular basis. But what what does it take to live in in that culture of miraculous works of God? Well, Peter lays it out. He says, repent. Change your mind. Spend time with Jesus and and change your mind about the way things are. And become enmeshed with him. Believe in him. And receive that power. Receive the Holy Spirit, the very presence of God in your life. Can it happen now? I believe it does happen now. And so Peter makes this invitation. And the invitation that Peter made 2,000 years ago is an invitation made to us this morning. These 120 other folks that were with Peter are, are, are part of this invitation. Come and join this movement. Come, be part of believing in Christ and become one with him and live by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Luke, who writes this account of the book of Acts, says that on that day, 3,000 people got saved. What's all this for? Are we doing it just because we could become a better Christian? Are we doing this just because we, we're kind of marking off the you know, uh, a bucket list of stuff that we want to experience as Christians. I, I, I invite you to, to cast those kinds of things aside if that's, if that's you, but to really think about this more as I want to live according to the way that I was made, according to the way that I was designed, according to the way that God has purposed me to live by his spirit, to live under his provision, to live under his, 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 his blessing. Now here's the point of Repentance. It's not so that you can get, get, get morally right. But really, repentance is about turning away from the self and turning to God. Repentance is about turning away from the self 
and turning to God, turning away from self-reliance to God-reliance. You see, so often repentance is mistaken with a, with a call to stop doing bad things or to stop being immoral. But what do you do when you're not that bad? What do you do when you're not struggling too much with doing stereotypically bad things? So God is concerned with things beyond that. Our actions are just surface level. That's what manifests from what's going on internally. Repentance is ultimately about turning away from yourself, not from your actions, but turning away from yourself and turning to God. Repentance is, is what happens when, when we turn away from the self and we turn away from the limited self and we turn to the unlimited God and we say, my life is in your hands. All my hope is in you and all the glory is yours, God. We just sung about that. That's repentance. But, but really what this happens is that, is that when God created Adam and Eve, he said, he, he, it says that he blessed them. He blessed them. And so we have to understand that the creator God, the God of this universe, his first thing his, 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 the disposition of his heart is he wants to bless you. He wants to bless us. And so repentance is really, uh, what it really is saying is, okay, it's about yielding ourselves and saying, okay, God, okay, I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you bless me by depending on you. I'll, I'll, I'll submit to you. I'll, I'll stop trying to produce the blessing. And I'll depend on you. I'll, I'll become like you're my lifeline. And that, that's what repentance is. It's that God is constantly pouring out blessings, but if your attention and your mindset is towards yourself, it's just never going to happen. So I've got this little object lesson for us today. This is a rare moment that adults get an object lesson. And what I'd like us to consider here is that you've got to imagine that if this water here is the blessings of God that he wants to pour out in your life. He wants to pour out his blessings in your life. But your attention is all on yourself. So no matter how much God is pouring out his blessings on you, it's, you're not filling up with anything. But when you repent and you turn and you yield yourself, you begin to overflow. Much more than you can even handle. Amen? Amen? This is repentance. This is repentance. Repentance is not, I've been such a terrible person. You know, if that's what you've learned repentance is, that's just like a minuscule part of biblical repentance. It's such a small part of it. Why are we stuck there when you hear the word repent? When I hear the word repent, i got to tell you, since I grew up in that mold of, of, of confessing your dirty, rotten sins and all your trash, right? right? When, when, when I, since I grew up in that mold, when I hear the word repent, I don't know about you, but it invokes all that stuff. I've been a bad boy. You know, I've been a bad person. That kind of thought. But biblical repentance is not about that. Gospel repentance especially is not about that. It's about, it's about letting go of all that stuff that you got to do to make your life right and saying, okay, God, I realize you're pouring out your living water. Upon me. You know, Jesus in one festival, he stands up, he says, if anybody will believe in me, if you would believe in me, out of him will flow rivers of living water. You know, if, if you would just release yourself and yield yourself to what God has for you, that's repentance and taking that step of faith. You must let God serve you. You must. Oh, Pastor Daniel, where do you get that idea from? The word bless, barak in Hebrew, means to get on your knees and serve the person you're blessing. So when God creates Adam and Eve and says, he blessed them, you got to imagine that God got on his knees and blessed Adam and Eve. Not the other way around. He didn't have them kneel. He got on his knees to serve. And, and, and thousands of years later, Jesus would get on his knees and wash the feet of his disciples. And serve them to show them what blessing is. That I'm the creator of this universe. And I'm your savior. I'm your teacher. I'm your Lord. But I'm going to serve you. Because I want to bless you. You have to let God serve you. Culturally, that might be a very difficult thing for many of us to swallow. I remember one time, my wife and my father-in-law were having a conversation about this matter. And she said to her father, Dad, you've got, you got to let God serve you. 
And he said, no, that's a little too much. Right? Because, because um, in a, a, lot of, a lot of places in Asian culture, it's top, everything's top down, right? And, and, and we have to always serve those who are above us. But God has always been in the business of turning things upside down. And so often, we don't walk regularly. We don't walk uh, in the real power of the Holy Spirit because we think we still have to do all this stuff to please God. We have to do all this stuff to, 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 to be right with God when God has already taken care of that in Jesus Christ and saying, look, I gave you my son to show you that you are already as infinitely as pleasing to me as my son is. That's what you are. But we have to believe in that, brothers and sisters. We have to, we have to believe that Jesus is enough to make us pleasing to God. When we understand that, we can go before God boldly in prayer. And we can start praying and receiving and living in the power of the Holy Spirit. Whatever that might be. Whatever that might be. And we all have stuff that we want to pray for. But, you know, when I talk about prayer of repentance today, it's not so that, you know, you could, in some ways, get things right with your life and, and fix yourself up before coming to church or, or, or get yourself right before dare asking God for stuff. No, a, a prayer of repentance is simply saying, I'm going to turn away from looking to myself to be the source of all my righteousness, to be the source of what qualifies me for God's blessings. Instead, I'm going to look up and avail myself so that God can pour out his spirit and pour out himself upon you. Repent, join Christ, submit yourself before Christ, and receive that Holy Spirit is what Peter is teaching us. Let me close with this one last illustration. Going back as I started off with Luke chapter 15 about the sheep. Did you know Luke 15 is all about repentance? It's all about repentance. But let me ask, how did, the she- how did the sheep repent? How, how did the sheep repent? You see, we know this is about repentance because after the shepherd rescues the sheep and comes back and throws a big party, Jesus says, well, there's a huge celebration that happens every time one sinner repents. Every time. We can go back, then go back, go back to the illustration. Look at the parable Jesus is teaching. Where, where you flip to the Bible. Whatever it is that you use, where, where, where did the sheep repent? What, what, what did he do? What did that sheep do to repent? Bad. <laughs> Cried out for help. Cried out for help in the wilderness somewhere lost. Didn't change his ways before getting rescued by the shepherd. Could not. Unable. But the sheep lets the shepherd carry it home. That's repentance. Where you give up. You give up. And you let go. And you let God carry you. Lift you up. Bless you. How did the sheep repent? The next parable. How does the coin repent when the woman's looking for the coin? Lastly, how does the son repent? The son did not repent. We get mistaken sometimes because the son was rehearsing a line. I have sinned against heaven and against you, Father. Make me like one of your hired men. When he gets to his father, he doesn't even say, make me like one of your hired men. But the father came to him even before he came to the father. And he allows the father to embrace him. Repentance is about yielding to God. And just saying, okay, I give up. You know, what makes a sheep allow the shepherd to carry it? Maybe it's because the sheep was so exhausted from wandering around and crying and crying that when the shepherd finally found it, it was ready to just let go. And sometimes that's the human experience. We struggle so hard with our 
might, with our intelligence, with our wisdom, with our experience, and we try so hard to get our life right. And it's only when we are so exhausted and we have run out of all of our options, we finally say, okay, God, okay, I give up. Okay, fine. It's unfortunate that we, we do that. We, we wait till it gets to that point. But what does God do whenever we get to that point? He rescues us. So what will you do? Will you repent with me? Jesus, I can't do it my way. I don't have what it takes. I've been looking down. I'm like the cup that's just face downward and you're pouring all your blessings on me and I can't get any bit of it. But I surrender so that I can receive all your provisions now. I believe that in order for us to live in the fullness of God's power and presence, it begins here. Praying a prayer of repentance. Again, casting aside whatever understanding of repentance we might have had in the past. But what we hear today, a prayer of repentance, which is basically surrender. Here, in this place. And when we do so, you hear Peter say, receive the Holy Spirit and live by the Holy Spirit. A life full of God's miracles and provisions is a life that has turned away and given up on the self and grabbed the hold of God and turned to God. A life full of the Holy Spirit's presence and activity is a life that has done that kind of repentance. And I pray that as you take a bold step in your faith to say, okay, I've been doing it all my way. Even going to church has been by my strength. Even committing to a small group has been by my strength. Even reading daily devotions has been by my strength. Even sharing God's love to someone else has been by my strength. Even every involvement of spirituality has been by my strength. I even surrender those things. I just yield and I say, I cannot, God, but you can if you would join me in that kind of a prayer, I want to invite you to take a moment to pray on your own and look to God. See Him ready to just embrace you and to, to pour out, continue to pour out His blessings. But we just have to be positioned right. So will you do that with me right now? Would you pray with me?